I drew back on him, and there was a tree overhanging. It wasn't. It was like a full tree. It wasn't a limb. It was like a, you know, a good diameter tree overhanging like that. And I kind of tried to scoot down a little bit in my saddle to shoot him. And he's like at 35, and I'm like, I don't think my arrow's gonna arc that much at 35. So like, I'll try it. And so I just squeezed off that shot. It broke, and that tree was about 10 yards away from me, and he was at 35. Half a second, it was like, and just rattled that tree, and it hit to the ground. Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Hunters of the Edge podcast. Today, I'm joined by my co-host here, Jake Gaylord. How's it going, dude? You know, we finally took this country back, so it's dang good, brother. <laughs> oh. oh, no one, no one <laughs> listening to this, I don't think, is going to argue with your, your excitement. No, about dude, it is, it's almost like a, uh, I don't want to be cliche and call it a movement, but it's definitely in the air. Like I was at a gas station just randomly filling up my equipment and this guy comes over and he's like, uh, which I ain't wearing like a hat or anything. I just, I'm just uh, putting gas in my stuff and taking care of all the leaves. And he's like, yeah, that time of year again, huh? And I was like, yeah. He said, yeah, that, that may suck, but hey, at least we got our country back. And I was like, you dang right we did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we That's did. Awesome. It's yeah. awesome. I you can't complain about that. We were on our vacation when we uh, figured that out, and I remember Justin came in to grab his stuff uh, to get dressed that morning. He goes, "I don't care if I don't see anything this morning." And he said, "We got our <laughs> dude." That's the way it is. Like I think everybody went to bed that night thinking that something shady was going to happen, and like, yeah, I know this ain't a political podcast, so we don't want to get too deep into it. But have you seen like the results of like how many votes? were actually in and then like throughout the last five or six elections from the Democratic Party, like each vote, like or each number of votes, and it was like sixty six thousand, sixty seven thousand, sixty four thousand. Or yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Million. And then uh with Biden, it was eighty eight million. Eighty one or million. whatever it was. And so it was like fifteen million more than normal. And then all of a sudden back to Kamala, it was like 64 million or something like that. And then it, like all the Democrats were griping about how, you know, where did all those votes go? And it's like, brother, they didn't even exist in the first you, place. You tell me. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. I would not crazy, but Hey, he's only president elect. We just got to get him to January and uh, we can start making America healthy again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make deer hunting great again, buy more public land, I'll be able to afford to drive to a uh, deer camp. Uh, it's a, it's a good day. God's yeah. looking down on us. Drill, baby, drill. And uh, I mean, here's a good thing. And I guess we can talk about it in a hunting, bring it back to hunting. His son, Trump Jr. I mean, he's a big time hunter. So yeah, I think we're, I think we're safe in that, in that space for now. Yeah. For now. Constant. We for won now. the battle. We haven't won the war, but yeah. So weird. today, today we're going to do a hunt talk episode. We got a lot of different formats that we do on the show. Uh, hunt talk is kind of just more of a water cooler conversation that we recap our most recent hunt that we went on. What's so funny? So I just gotta, I just gotta share this cause I, I just not thought of it and I listened to it yesterday. People who want another podcast to listen to go listen to uh, real AF with Andy Frisella. Mm-hmm. They were talking about this, and he was like, "Dude, I'm so surprised Trump won." He said, "I was already practicing my my uh, dick tuck." Oh my god, that's terrible! <laughs> Becoming a woman. Yeah, he said. He said, "I had I had special duct tape and everything," but no, that that I lost it yesterday when I was listening to that. But I hate it. Was also living. Um, thought I thought I'd share that, but go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, that we really needed that. <laughs> Uh, we do hunt talks. We also do uh, long form interviews on the show where we'll have guests and we do a new, another series that we just recorded one of those uh, called the basics of hunting, where we talk about anything from scrapes, rubs, sign, e-scouting, trail camera strategy, just simple digestible stuff. It's usually 25 to 30 minutes on those episodes and we do those a couple times a month. But this time we're doing a hunt talk episode and we're recapping uh, a recent trip to the Oklahoma mountains hunting public land. So uh, that's what we're going to get into today. But before we get into that, uh, I think we should uh, we should do our verse of the day. Put it in a headline. Comes from Matthew eleven twenty eight. It says, "Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest." And just throw a little bit of context on that. This is a passage when Jesus is speaking to the people of Israel, 
who were burdened by the heavy religious laws and the struggles of daily life. And many were feeling weary and spiritually worn out, searching for relief, and Jesus invites them to come to him, offering rest and refreshment for their souls. So what does this mean to you, Christy? I think that true rest only let, only uh, exists in the presence of the Lord. You know, just like a lot of the key qualities uh, that we desire in our life, like peace and comfort and rest and hope, like you, those things are only found in, in the creator of the universe, which is which is Jesus. So I, I think we look to other things many times to give us rest. You know, I need entertainment or I need um, a better mattress, I, whatever you're looking to. But just I think true rest comes from the Lord. And like, I think this election season was a really good example of that. Like every everything is in the control of God. Like you can have peace and hope and have rest that this is already all laid out before us. So that's what it means to me. What does it mean to you? I mean, yeah, no, basically the same. I mean, when you're feeling burdened or exhausted, you know, this scripture reminds us that we can always come to him and he offers rest, whether that be spiritually or basically something to satisfy your soul. We have to come to him for that. And that's, I think, what true rest is. So it, ma- it makes me think of that illustration that you've heard probably in church before of like, we walk in with our baggage, like, and you know, our sin and our lack of rest and peace. And we walk in with it, like in a backpack. And a lot of times we like try to set it at the altar of like, here you go, Jesus, this is yours. I'm giving this to you, Lord. And then before we, uh, before we walk away, we go, you know what? I think I'm going to take it with me. I'm going to deal with it. And then you put it back on your shoulders and you walk away with that. There is a place to find rest and peace, but it's only in the Lord. And we have to like lay it at his feet. And oftentimes I think we choose, especially as men to walk around with it and you don't have to, there's a place to put it and there's a place to find rest. Yeah. Now that, now that there's no more quiet, quiet spots and safe zones for people around here, you know, now, now that we got rid of those, they can actually go to a place where they can feel secure and actually have rest. You know what I mean? Not that, yeah, not, not those fake little rooms where you can go in coloring books and tell about your feelings. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I need one of those too. There's one place for that, but uh, go ahead. With that, you know, on our long form episodes, we try to do a verse of the day every time just to try to put first things first and just uh, spread the gospel, talk about the Lord. But now we're going to get into the hunt talk portion of the show, which is one of our favorite hunts of the year, or at least my favorite hunts of the year, especially because everybody gets to get get together. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this um, do one as well. But this was our rutcation. So I think, Jake, you've we've been doing this for four or five years um, in a row. And with that, why don't you briefly kind of set the set the scene on what the what this hunting trip is all about and kind of where we went and what our goals are for this trip? Well, usually it's about killing, you know, big giant bucks and having a great time with friends and family. But we did the latter. We just didn't do the first thing I described. I don't think any yep. big bucks fell out of our group this this week. Now, granted, it wasn't like the normal rotation, like me and Jordan got up there like on Monday, you know, you and Justin's been down there since I think Friday evening right. or something like yeah. that. So like people were hit and miss plus mix, mixed with bad weather. Like we were seeing deer and, you know, one of us got a shot opportunity. We'll get into that here later. But historically, we usually try to go down there as a group. We stay for a week and I mean, yeah, we just try to try to get it done and the we call it the big woods of Oklahoma, right? Like Pennsylvania, all those northern states classified as big woods but oklahoma has some mountainous terrain in it right and which we like to hunt it's just you know it's challenging there's low deer density but hey if you see a deer chance of it being a pretty good one or you know pretty all right so with that you know we've had a lot of good success we've been probably hunting it since 2016 but it seems like every year when we went down there we would have success but this just this year it's it's crazy i mean I guess we win at one thing and lose at the other and we won the election, but the deer just, I don't know, weren't on our side. They're fighting back at us. Yeah. And, you know, when people think of a rutcation, they probably think of hunting big giant bucks in the Midwest and, you know, chasing deer like that. And we're we're out here hunting. We're going to the place that it's even harder to rut hunt, which is the mountains. Um, But I think my expectations for the hunt, similar to yours, are hunt an entire week hopefully have one shot opportunity at a buck that makes you happy. And so let me, let me ask you this. And I want you to be brutally honest since we didn't get to have like a full discussion about this before we left. What were your expectations coming into this rotation? Because 
a few weeks ago, you shot a 162 off of your lease, right? So like your trigger finger ain't itching, right? Like September, you killed an elk. A few weeks ago, you killed a 162. Like you, no reason to have a trigger finger. But what was your expectations coming into this big woods hunt? To shoot a mountain buck. I mean, that was, that was it. Like obviously, you know, Justin's kind of put that little 300 inch mark in my ear, which is like a... You know, hey, I want to shoot two bucks at average 150. And I'm like, you know, that'd be nice. So I got a 162. I'd like to shoot a 138 or better. But that quickly was was not the case. I have the last two years, including this year, it'd be three years. I haven't really had got to hunt a ton in the mountains. Like last year, I was completely tagged out, didn't get a hunt at all. This year, I got to hunt nine days. The year before that, I got, or the, in 2022, I got to hunt a little bit. I just hadn't shot a mountain buck in like three years. And so my, expectations were like, I just want to shoot one that gets me going, you know, hopefully somewhere around that Pope and Young mark, which I think is realistic with a week Mm -hmm. of, you know, with a week of hunting. Um, But I can tell you, I got down there on Friday evening, Saturday morning, I went into a spot I call the Y, uh, just a big, three big drainages that come together and there's bedding on all sides. And I had never hunted on this side of the Y or ever approached it from that side. And like 930 in the morning, I bought a black rack express shipped it to my house from Amazon because I was like, I'm going to do some rattling. You know, it's like November 1st. I rattled at about 930. I hadn't seen a deer yet. And I just see a buck walking up the drainage and he's walking like on a string. I, I, I was, I was pulling him on a string and you know, he's just a nice, nice buck. I, I really, I haven't even got to look at the footage a ton. I don't know how big he was. I don't know if he was 70 inches or a hundred. One of the crap head bucks. Yeah, little turds, little turd heads. Yeah, about like that. That buck comes in on like a string. I don't know what it was. I hadn't got a shot at a mountain buck in a long time. And I was like, I'm going to shoot that thing. Like, I'm going to shoot that buck. And so I grabbed my bow. What sucked about it was he had me pegged from the beginning. And he was looking up in the, he was looking up in the tree where I was at immediately at like 35 yards. And he just kept walking in, kept walking in and started to do that kind of herky jerk movement while I was sitting in the tree. And I grabbed my bow, zoomed in, got the camera on him. Of course, he caught me um, with the camera zooming in on him. And I had my bow in my hand already. And so he kind of did that little soft trot that they do. And I'm like, ah, well, I'm busted. And he stopped at like 35 yards. I got him stopped. And I drew back on him. And there was a tree overhanging. It wasn't, it was like a full tree. It wasn't a limb. It was like a, you know, a good diameter tree overhanging like that. And I kind of tried to scoot down a little bit in my saddle to shoot him. And he's like, got 35. And I'm like, I don't think my arrow is going to arc that much at 35. So like, I'll try it. And so I just squeezed off that shot. It broke. And that tree was about 10 yards away from me. And he was at 35. And it didn't get out of my bow half a second. It was like, and just rattled that tree. And it hit to the ground. And as he kind of bounded off, I was like, okay, maybe that was for the best. Like just looking at, just looking at the size of him, he wasn't a buck I probably should have been shooting, but he got me going and I shot. Where do you think he was? I I really don't know. I, like I said, somewhere between 70 and a hundred inches, probably just an eight pointer. Now yeah, he had a little bit better frame than, you know, just a a dink, but looking back at the video, just on my little two inch LCD screen, it just, his tines were short. Like he had a decent little frame, but his tines were real, real short and his eye guards were short. So. Somewhere between 70 and 100 inches. He bounded off. And the I was thing like, about it is, is like the, on those little bitty bodies, it kind of messes with, you, messes with you a little bit because you're like, you're not used to seeing a whole lot of deer down there. So there's not like a you reference. Know, you're not seeing a buck, yeah. and a buck and then a buck. And then exactly. A buck. Yeah. So whenever you see it, you're like, oh my God, those are horns. And then, you know, before you even look at it good enough, obviously you're going to get everything ready. Like you got a lot to do if you're filming your hunts, right? You got to turn on your camera. You got to, you know, range it on where you think it's going to walk, you know, and then pick up your bow and get ready. Right. So like, yeah, multiple steps. And so before you, whether decide what, like whether you're going to shoot it or not, if you don't really get a, that good of a glimpse of it, you're doing everything you need to do to be able to shoot when it comes time. And then you're making your decision usually. But for me, yeah, if, if I usually have a bow in my hand before I'm like, you know, I have to kind of think about it to make a decision nine times out of 10, I'm flinging an arrow, but you know, maybe that ain't the best way to go about it. If you guys are anything like us, you love being in the deer woods and chasing big bucks. But there's another part of you that has that itch to chase other big game species. If you've ever dreamed of chasing black bear, mule deer, or moose, Alberta, Canada is the land of opportunity for these adventure style hunts. Each year, hundreds of first time visiting hunters from around the world come to Alberta for the options, quality, and accessibility that the land offers. 
With over 1,800 Boone and Crockett entries and endless possibilities of taking multiple species on a single trip, Alberta is truly a paradise for a big game hunter. This is why we partnered up with the Alberta Professional Outfitters Society. To check it out, go to apos.ab.ca and click Find an Outfitter. From there, you can browse all the different big game species and hunting styles that fit with what you want out of the hunt. Or you can send a free hunt inquiry through the follow the lead tool and the outfitters who have what you are looking for will reach out to you directly. So make sure to check out apos.ab.ca to learn all about hunting in Alberta and get connected to the right outfitter for you. Well, all I knew was like, okay, he's wider than his ears. I knew he's wider than his ears. I was like, it's a pretty good buck. Like, yeah, he didn't, uh, he wasn't a scorer, you know, but he had like a decent little presence to him. Did he on that? Right. I think you saw it on the screen. Like he just had a nice frame. Like it just, yeah, no, he did. Tine length was short, but like just had a nice frame. It's probably a three year old, two year old, three year old, something like that. Yeah. Binked it into the ground. And I got to, that was like bigger running away, but I got to watch him bound off a few times. And I was like, okay, that was probably for the best. So that was yeah. my, that was my first encounter. And then I went and told everybody at camp and they're like, you're going to shoot a 160 and then come shoot a, a 80 or 90 inch. And I was like, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say it like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess not. But I'm here to shoot deer, man. Like, me and Lauren got a baby on the way. And I'm not going to get to go very much anymore. And it's like, I was down there at camp with everybody. And I wanted to shoot a deer. And that one got me excited enough to shoot. Now, if he would have came back again by, again, I wouldn't have shot him. But in that moment, I was like, I want to shoot this deer. Yeah. So, yeah, I understand. You got to make excuses to kill deer. All right. I get it. I do, too. Oh, I don't got to make an excuse. I was going to shoot him. <laughs> No, I know. It ain't an excuse. I just, I was going to shoot him. I said, oh, trust me. I'm saying, I shot a hundred intro last year and I don't regret it one bit. So no, I sight was 20, 20. I'm not saying that only when he ran off was I like, oh, I shouldn't have shot him. If I would have hit him, I'd have been like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, well, oh, how was the conditions there? Like your first couple of days? Weird. But I, we talked, we talked about this a little bit. I think I talked to it with you and Carol and Jake Ayers and, but. It just seems like more and more, we don't get cold until like mid-December in Oklahoma. And I know it's like a Southern state, but then people like, I guess from the Midwest would expect that. But it was, it was probably lows. I was waking up in the mornings and it was 70 in the morning. And the temperature was not showing that on the weather app either. Uh, A lot of rain, raining a ton. You know, usually you associate that rain with like bringing in cold front and that cold air. But we had a lot of tornado warnings. All the rain was bringing in was warm air. So you'd be in the stand, warm, raining, and windy. Like the trifecta for seeing like no deer. Like 40 mile an hour winds and 70 degrees and raining. So it was just, it was a bad conditions. Still, I saw, I saw several deer in the first couple of days, but you know, just very slow movement and very hot. So, right. um, which is, I guess what you can come to expect. In so, the part of November. Yeah. So uh if you're if you're a long time listener, you probably heard of, you know, Jordan and Justin, the people we camp with and share share our experiences down there with. Uh since obviously they're not they're not on here for this pod. Uh what were what were I guess Jordan went down there just yet. So what was Justin seeing? Was he kind of similar or not much? Like he was it, there was I think there was one time where he walked up on a buck uh, that was already standing on a ridge, and I think he said he either saw one more buck or uh, the same one circle back around um, at a spot mm-hmm. and then he shot a doe. But like, it was just those single digit hunts. Like, oh, I saw a doe or I saw two or, you know, I saw a spike. And right. it was just, you know, that typical hot weather. But you kind of, I've always kind of went to this thing of like, yeah, but pre-rut and rut trumps weather, right? And what I've realized is like, nothing trumps the weather. Like maybe, maybe you'll still see running activity in the absolute peak of the rut if it's 70 degrees. But if it's not the absolute peak, you're probably not going to see it like you would think. And yeah, it just seems like to me, the rut hunts year after year, even in the November 10th, 11th, 12th, those ranges, it just seems like they've gotten worse than they used to be. And I think a lot of that has to do with the weather. Yeah. You were talking uh, yesterday on the phone and you were like, yeah, I remember in high school, it'd be November and we'd be bundling up to go duck hunt we had to break ice on ponds and all that stuff and that was in november and it's like now we don't even get that until maybe christmas or january yeah or february it's crazy 
it's probably just global warming, man. Maybe it is, but it's just like, I don't know. I just remember in like we went to high school at like 2011 through 15 and took concurrent classes. So we could go, I like me and Carol did so we could go duck hunt in the morning. That was I, really, I really would never go deer hunting um, in the mornings, but I just remember it being colder. Like, the just consistently i remember being in november because it was like wrestling or basketball season and it's like dude you better not be going to school at 6 30 or 7 o'clock without a freaking two jackets on are you sure you're gonna die are you sure it wasn't just because you were maybe a few less lbs back then or what's up i thought but i thought uh maybe maybe that's the case um i know it definitely is the case but dude it just it be so much colder in yeah it just seems like uh, now the deer hunting probably wasn't nearly as good, but mm-hmm. um, I just saw more activity. Like my dad would drive us around before school a lot and we'd just drive around and see freaking bucks running across the road and rutting, you know, obviously spots we couldn't hunt, but it's still fun to watch. Or how many times um, did you shoot out the window? Zero. Oh, okay. Zero for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't do That's that. a joke, people. It's fine. No, but uh, Justin passed up a pretty good little six point there uh, a few week, weeks back and he said uh, last few days when we were there that he kind of regrets passing that deer up because he thought it was going to be, you know, pretty simple. Like, oh, I'm already seeing good movement here in mid-October. Like, heck, I'm going to wait till the rut and it should be dynamite. Yeah. That's just the way it is, though. Like, it can be really hot, you know, in one spot. And then, you know, a few weeks later, it's like, okay, nothing now. Now, do you have to go find other spots? Maybe that's the case, but seems like every spot you go look at, it's like, oh man, there has to be deer here. Oh yeah, there has to be sign. But sometimes, I don't know, I think it just boils down to like, obviously time in a tree, but I think, I mean, you just have to be in the right place at the right time. You know, you can't change the weather either. You can change the spot that you're at. You can change the spot you're looking for sign and hanging, but you can't change the weather. Like it's just been, it's been hot. Like I just, I was hunting like November 3rd or 4th down there. And I'm like, dude, it feels like October 1st. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't feel like the rut at all. How was the sign down there? Like, were there more rubs and scrapes or than there was two weeks ago or no? Yeah, we talked about this on the basics of hunting a little bit last podcast, but I saw a lot more sign, a spot that I'd only seen one rub in the previous weeks. Two weeks later, I saw six on the way to the stand. Didn't ever really get in any scrapes that were fresh or open, hmm. but the uh, the rubs were there. I was seeing a lot more rubs. Um, going in and a lot more beds. Do you think those ribs could have been there or do you th- like, do you think they were just covered up by the foliage and like maybe the grass starting to go dormant was making it a little bit more visible or do you think those were like, no, those, they look, they look fresh to me. Yeah. A lot, a lot of saplings. I didn't never really see a lot of those big rubs, but a lot of saplings. So what does that say to you? Like when you see those, you know, uh, the abundance of rubs and maybe for the people that's listening that might just now be getting into hunting, right? Like I know that's what we do the basics of hunting for, but what does that tell you? The, the, the uptick in sign and even if, you know, obviously that's due to conditions, but even if you're not seeing like the deer, so to speak, what does that uptick of sign tell you? Does that like good, bad, you know, kind of something you just brush off? I mean, it gets me, it gets me excited for what's to come because, and it also tells me like, if I see five, six, seven, eight rubs, could that be one rub line that a buck's like walking up and hitting all those? Yeah, it could be. But to me, that seems like there's more bucks in this area than one. It was exciting. There was a lot more sign, but you know, I think a lot, a lot of it's confidence, right? When you're going into the stand, you're like, I'm going to shoot a buck. This day. I'm going to shoot a buck today. And when you're going in the stand, you're waking up and it's 70 degrees. You're like, I'm not going to shoot a buck today. <laughs> Do I need my sweatshirt? Yes or no? It's like, no. Okay, cool. But no, like even in the mornings, we weren't hunting good weather, which this sounds like a freaking, uh, a money bag full of excuses. And it kind of is, but, um, I'll tell you it is. It just is what it is. <laughs> that was Saturday morning where you where you shot at that buck, and then I assume the rest of the time, basically until Monday when all that crappy weather stopped, you kind of got skunked. Yeah, the rest of the time I saw a, uh, I saw a spike, saw a spike in that spot, and then I saw two dead. You mean an eleven point? Yeah, Boone and Crockett, Spoon and Crockett is what they call that. Spoon and Crockpot. Yeah, Spoon and Crockpot. I uh, saw a spike, saw two does, and it was a. Uh, it was just slow, man. Until until you showed up, it was it was pretty slow. I, I tried to stick out that spot in the Y. Um, went and hunted the community center on that would have been Tuesday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, Monday I hunted, and got skunked, 
And then uh, you showed up and you were pretty eager to get to the stand because it was like kind of raining, kind of felt a little cooler. And then yeah. we got hit pretty good with a with a rainstorm. Yeah, there was rain. And then, which it wasn't like, it sucked because it was like off and on rain. And I was like, oh, I know it's already late. Like it's late in the evening. I only got like an hour and a half to hunt, but I got a spot that's not that far away. And I was like, I could go swing in there because, you know, I'm here to hunt. So what else am I doing? Because it gets dark at like 5.30 now. And it's like, what am I going to do? Just go back and lay down until tomorrow morning. It's like, no. So I try to go hunting, but then, you know, you've seen a few flashes of lightning. You're like, hmm, that ain't worth it. Better not. Yeah, better not. So, but that next morning it did kind of clear, clear up. So this would be Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Right. So I was having a little bit of fun right off the bat. All right. Like I, I've always wanted to be that person where I just show up at the camp and then the very next hunt, it's like I'm dragging something out. And finally that happened. It wasn't with a buck, but I had a doe. And so what happened Tuesday? What were you like? You hadn't been hunting. I'd been hunting and I probably not, probably not giving you the best, uh, hope on like, Hey, how's the movement? Uh, nothing, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, so what were you, what were you thinking going in Tuesday? Uh, I was thinking, Hey, it's November. Anything can happen. And yeah. the way it was working out on the forecast, it's like, okay, I think the reason, and we talked about this, I think the reason why you all ain't seeing anything is just cause you know, high winds, warm weather, a little bit of rain. Like if I was a buck and especially a mature buck, I'd be bunkered down too. Right. Yeah. So it, that was all supposed to uh, wind down on Tuesday. And, you know, I was showing up on Tuesday. So I was, you know, I had fresh legs and then also the weather is supposed to be halfway decent. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm feeling pretty optimistic. Plus the spot I'm trying to set in first, that's been, you know, historically pretty good for me. Now, when I say historically, I just mean last year, but there was always good movement. And the last couple of weeks when I hunted that spot, uh, I would always see, you know, a pretty good doe group. And I'm like, hey, you know, it only takes one doe to bring by a big old buck. And then I'm already in the chips. So I go in and set and, you know, it's pretty, it's still a little, little windy that, that morning. I think it's just trying to, you know, that was the last of the, of the high winds. And, but I don't know, it's probably 730, might be like 8 a.m. or something. I seen no, it's probably about seven thirty. I seen a little small buck, like a little four pointer, mm-hmm. kind of cruise up on top of this little this little ridge. And obviously, it was too small to shoot, but it was also too far away to shoot, even if I wanted to. So that was cool. And I was like, nice, they're on their feet. That's good. And then a little bit later, I seen probably three minutes later, I seen a little doe go up that kind of same ridge, but up more up up a hill on this grassy top. And I was like, okay, cool. Like hopefully, plus I have signal in that spot. So I'm chilling. I'm like, this is a great time. Well, I don't know. It's probably about eight, eight fifteen. I have three doe walk into my left and I'm like, okay, that's that doe group that I always see. Cool. Let's see if something, something's behind them. And I did my due diligence and it was just a bad day for that doe not to be in estrus, but, uh, no buck behind her made sure of it. But one of them walked probably seven yards under my stand and I had to put the VPA through both shoulders, baby. So there was a, there was a freezer queen and the ice chest later that morning. So it was a little hunt. She was like standing at 10 yards when you busted her. Yeah. Yeah. Like she, she ran. Yeah. Basically. I mean, she had two, two other does with her, but they were like 30 yards off. And I was like, Hey, listen, normally I wouldn't take a doe in, in November, but with this, 300 yard drag that I have out of here and you know if someone's going to give you a layup you're going to take a layup you're not going to dribble back to the three point line and shoot so that's just where I'm at so you shoot her and she didn't run very far at all no which it, it was great like the the whack and there's a there's a feeling whenever it like works out too easy and you're just like oh so this is the way hunting should go sometimes not like sometimes. every once every decade and that's just what happened. Like she, I shot, she crow hopped and then she ran like 30 yards. I don't even know how she made it 30 yards. And then I, I just see her like tip over in that tall grass and I'm like sick, but it kind of scared me a little bit. Cause I seen her go down, but you know, when you get down from the tree and you're like, I kind of lost my bearings a little bit. So Dude, I, it's so easy to do that. Yeah. Well, you're in nipple high grass and all of a sudden you go down this hill and I already packed up my stuff and I left my bag by the base of the tree as a reference, but I couldn't even see my bag. So I'm just like guessing which tree I was in. And I was like, I think I'm over here. I looked for, for like five minutes. I started panicking. I was like, where the hell is she? 
I was like, well, maybe she's more over here. And she was 20 yards away, bundled up. And I was like, sick. But yeah, that was the first warning. Listen, guys, we wouldn't be able to do the podcast if it wasn't for you all. So we just want to say that you guys are greatly appreciated. And thank you for following along each week. And speaking of support, we are partnered with Out on a Limb Manufacturing. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, Matt and Chase are great down-to-earth guys. And they make some of the best saddle hunting products out there. Whether you're looking for a set of climbing sticks or a mobile, lightweight, hang-on tree stand, or maybe you're even a one-sticker. You mean tree Pilates? Yes, tree Pilates. If you've been to the grocery store or the gas station lately, you know that Uncle Joe is doing his absolute worst to take all your money. That's why we need hunting gear that lasts year after year. And trust me, I've been rocking the same out on a limb Shakar climbing sticks for four years and the Ridge Runner 2.0 saddle hunting platform for a few years as well. This gear is built to last. We can confidently say that out on a limb is the best bang for your buck. And it's the best gear if you want to deflate a big old buck. Ooh. Make sure you use code HNTA15 at outonalimbmfg.com for 15% off anything on their website. So if you can show them the same support that you guys show us, please go to outonalimbmfg.com and use code HNTA15 for 15% off at checkout. Now let's get back to the podcast. So you shot a, you shot a couple of those so far. How, how important do you think that was like building confidence on like shot process? Because we talked about that a lot before the season this yeah. year. It's like we got to shoot some does to like sharpen the sword. I don't want to demasculate myself or however you want to word it too much, but I was having some pretty good trouble with uh, like a, like deer fever a little bit. And also my mindset was like, how have I ever killed one of these things with a bow in my life before? Right. Cause it seems like here lately, every single like good buck that I shot at something would go wrong or it felt like I was shooting off one foot, leaning, leaning sideways a little bit. And it's like, how, like, how is this ever going to work out for me? And then I kind of was talking to you about it and it's just like, Hey, listen, you only get, if you're lucky, you only get six times, at least here in Oklahoma to shoot a deer and you go through that real time experience. Right. And only two of those are with a buck. And there's a lot of people that probably don't even fill both buck tags uh, each each year. And especially does, right? Like, because probably a lot of people were in the same boat as me. And it's like, hey, I don't want to shoot my does in October because I don't want to ruin this spot. Or I don't want to shoot my does in November because, you know, I don't want to waste a doe when a buck could be behind her. And it's like, so then you get to December and it's like either people have already burnt out or, you know, they're just like, I don't need a doe. I don't want to even deal with it. I don't want to clean it, gut it, all that stuff. So long story short, you don't really get that many game time experiences. And so that's just kind of what I wanted to change this year. And I think that a hundred percent helped my confidence because I've shot it. I've shot at some doe and I mean, one went 20 yards and this one went like 35 to 40 yards. And I was like, okay, so it is possible to kill a deer now. An antlered one, that's a different story, but we'll just, you know, deal with that when we get there. To be determined. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see when you smack a big buck here in a week if uh, <laughs> if it really came to fruition. So yeah. we, uh, that Tuesday morning, you went out and hunted. You obviously shot a doe. I saw a spike where I was hunting. I proceeded to hunt there like two more times without seeing a deer. What were you seeing the rest of the time? Because you shot, you used one of your best spots, burned it to shoot a doe. And All right. Then, and I, I don't think that that was necessarily a burn. Like, I think I could have went back in there and, and seen a buck, but I had two trail cameras hung in that little area too. And I checked those and there wasn't like, there were some bucks on it and some bucks in like daylight. And I was like, you know, only one trail camera was really on like a really good, uh, little trail. And I was like, there, there could obviously be other bucks in here using, and I know there, there is, but I also have four cameras in this other spot, you know, that we call the deadhead spot. And I want to go check. And so that's why I really went there and hunted the the next couple sits. And what did you see? Because I have no uh, reportings to tell because I saw I went three sits in a row without seeing anything. Nice. Yeah. The first set in the deadhead spot, I seen only seen one little small buck, like maybe, maybe 40 inches. And I was halfway setting up my tree still. Like I'm, I'm at the base of the tree. I, I just now put one stick on and all of a sudden I hear something like come running towards me. And I'm like, is it a pig? Is it a bear? Is like, what the heck is that? And all of a sudden I kind of look and I see glimpses of antler and I'm like, oh dang. So I drop, grab my bow and I go to knock it and it seen me do that. And it, cause I still didn't really know what it was. And then it kind of bounded off. And when it was bounding off, I seen the little rack and I was like, oh, that's pretty sick. 
you know, because at first I wasn't really too confident walking in because, A, I didn't bump anything walking in. And then, B, there was two scrapes that were by my tree and I just kind of went and looked and they weren't opened up at all. And I was like, nice. So I didn't really have the greatest confidence setting up, but I was like, hey, you never know. Like it was good a couple weeks ago, so I just got to try it out. And that that was the only deer encounter I had that whole that whole sit. And so I just packed up my stuff, and I think I went and set Grandpa's spot afterwards. Mm-hmm. Now, what did you see? What did you see there? So this that, had been Wednesday evening for everyone yes. following along. Yep. So Wednesday evening, I went and set Grandpa's, and uh, previously I sat there, and there was this one little tree that I kept seeing Dove kind of funnel through or funnel by. And I sat there and I was like, hey, if they were funneling by this, hopefully one of them will uh, bring along a buck, you know, the next time one strolls by. And none of them did, but where I, I could see a new little area from where I was sitting in that tree. And as soon as it got daylight, I was like, man, over there looks money. But it was like 620 at this at this time and it's already been daylight or that gray light for like 10, 15 minutes. And I was like, I just better stay here. And about seven minutes later, I see a buck just mill around right by that spot, probably 75, 80 yards away. And I'm like, damn. But even if I would have moved, I wouldn't have been set up in time to even catch that buck strolling through. You'd have been at the base of the tree and he'd have been like, exactly. Yep. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just move there the next sit. And I, uh, that sit, I just seen that, that buck and then I seen a doe. Well, so that next morning, which would be Thursday morning, when no, no, Wednesday, Wednesday evening, that next mm-hmm. hit, I go and I don't see a dang thing at all. But, uh, so I'm sitting along this, uh, this creek bottom and I got that block timber that I was in to my right and all up in front of me is like a overgrown select cut. And then to my left, I have probably 80 yards away. I have a little finger of trees coming from the same from the base of the same creek bottom that I'm sitting well all back behind me on the other side of the creek on top of the the first little ridge I hear something and there's some like wild horses out there that just kind of roam around and it kind of sounded like that a little bit like like maybe four or five of them just kind of like walking on like the rocks because I didn't know what that side of that ridge look like so I was like it could be rocky and there could be horses because I kept hearing like like almost like type of stuff like and it sounded sounded very horse horse like and plus when they walked it felt it sounded like the rocks kind of like a slate rock kind of falling and hitting each other on the way down and I was like this that's so weird like it sounds horse like but then again I I kept listening and I thought I heard a grunt but it was really faint and I was like what is I couldn't tell what it was Mm mm-hmm and so I was like, you know, just kind of whatever. It's probably just horses, but I didn't see or hear anything like for sure deer at all. That's it. But, you know, Thursday morning we're leaving or after the Thursday morning hunt, we're leaving. But uh, is there anything else on Wednesday? Did, did you see anything Wednesday? No, no. That was my streak of uh, nothing sits. So I moved away from the wind check the trail camera spot. Jake Harrison shot his buck and had some decent bucks on that camera nothing crazy probably 120 inches the biggest one and so i was like well there's nothing to call home about on that camera i'm going back to the caramel spot and you kind of convinced me to go back to the caramel spot that next morning. there well because you're in that general area right yeah because since we weren't hunting i mean we're hunting for sure less than a mile away from each other but we rode together and i usually come in on a different road and then access it right there but i was like hey look there's another road that that kind of comes up right through here when you drive by to your spot i'll just jump out right there and i'll just come in the back way well when i went to di- do that on the way out on wednesday night i seen you know cuz i was already sitting by two pretty good rubs well across that creek where i heard all that horse like activity i seen another rub and another rub and another rub and these are on some some like pretty good sized little cedar trees and i'm thinking dang like Surely not, like, surely not that, like, I it didn't even pop in my mind, like, that's what it was, was, oh, that that was Bucks chasing, but uh, it so happened to be, and I'll get into that here in a second, but, so really good sign walking out, walking into the morning, I seen, you know, a few, a few more rubs that I could just kind of see with my phone light, because I don't like really using my headlamp when I get super close to my spot, so I just turn my phone light, like, them so it can go and hold it by my feet. 
kind of watch where I'm stepping. But uh, I get set up super, super quiet. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. Like I already had all my stuff hung from, from the last evening. And I sit there and as soon as it starts getting gray light, like the whole time I'm, I'm waiting on to get daylight, the wind just hit me in my face, like right the way I'm walking or I walked in and I'm like, okay, this is going to be a good morning. I can feel it. As soon as it starts getting gray light, the wind shifts, hits the back of my neck. And I'm like, well, that sucks. Then, you know, 30 seconds later, it hits me to my left and then my right, like it's throwing Mike, Mike Tyson punches at this point. And I'm like, damn. It's just swirling and it's doing that for the next couple hours. And then about 8.30, like I've already decided, like I'm not seeing a dang thing. Bow hunting is a game of confidence. And the last thing that you want to be thinking about when you're at full draw on a giant buck this fall is, I hope this broadhead does its job. I prefer a reliable fixed blade broadhead that's tough, flies great, and penetrates deeply no matter the arrow setup. And that's why us guys at the Hunters Advantage shoot Vantage Point Archery Broadheads. And just a few weeks ago in September, I laid down my first bull elk with the VPA Omegas. In my mind, there's no reason to risk messing with a broadhead that can have a mechanical failure when you can get a super tough, reliable broadhead that's sharp and flies great, and you don't have to worry about the thing failing on you. And if you needed any other reason to choose VPA, they're 100% made in America. To check them out, go to vparchery.com and make sure to use code HA10 at checkout for 10% off your next pack of broadheads. Once again, that's vparchery.com and make sure you use code HA10 at checkout for 10% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. And because there was one point in time, it was hitting on my left, my left cheek and then it literally two seconds later it hit my nose, my right cheek. Back, you know, the back of my head and I'm here, dude, I'm just I like, I'm getting washed away if that's the case. Yeah. Well, uh, about 830 rolls around and I think I hear a deer walking behind me, like in, in this creek bed, about 60, 70 yards through some timber. I can't really see it. But before I get turned around all the way, I hear it stomping and then it bounds off. And I'm like, like it wasn't no emotion whatsoever. I was like, could have figured that like it caught a whiff of me. But I heard, but I heard it stop, and I was like, "Okay, maybe the wind's swirling so much that it just caught a slight whiff." But in it, but it's like, where did it come from? Where did it go? Like, like what's going on here? Where did I come from? Where did I go? Where did yeah, hot night, Joe? Exactly. <laughs> and about three minutes later, I see two two doe walk up uh, this little block timber where I was sitting the previous morning, and then I see another little doe run back down the creek. I don't know if it got a whiff. I mean. She just said the heck with you guys. But the other two though were milling around about 70 yards inside this timber. I can just barely get, you know, glimpses of them. And then as I'm sitting there watching them, about five minutes later, I see a, a little bitty doe come across this field and run into this uh, little finger of timber to my left. And so as I'm sitting there watching both to make sure there ain't a buck behind either one of these little doe groups, uh, I hear some crashing coming up from this uh, clear cut. And of course it's tall grass, so I don't see them until they're on me, but I hear crashing and I hear like a few grunts and I'm like, Oh, here we go. The doe's heading directly towards me. And I'm in a tree, probably the size, like a big round is my head. And so if I move any like tree, yeah, it was exactly big brain, baby. But, uh, so like, um, with that being said, I'm probably only eight foot off the ground. Like my platform is probably at only eight feet. She runs directly underneath me. And this is all happening like five second period. And I see a buck behind her and I'm like, oh, here we go. I grab my bow. And then before I even get it off the rack, I'm still looking at it. It's just a little spike. And I'm like, damn it. The only hot doe around here, it only has a spike. But as soon as I like recognize the spike, I hear burp, 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 burp. And I'm like, oh, there's another one. So I immediately get it, like get my bow out. I'm trying to whip it around to my weak side and get ready. And I see another buck and it's like a little low basket rack, probably. 80, 90 inches. And then all of a sudden I hear more grunts and there's another buck, a little bit bigger, probably like 115 ish, 120 ish, maybe. And then I see another buck and it like every single one of them are just grunting their heads off, just, blah, blah, just zombified. And I see another buck and it's like, that one's the biggest one for sure. Now, again, it all happened really fast, but I'm thinking anywhere from like mid 120s to like, mid 130s is where I'm putting it and like I, th- I think he was at 10 I'm not really sure but like definitely a shooter he was definitely a shooter and so the doe runs two two yards under me and it's like continuing to go all the other ones kind of run 
directly under me, but that big one kind of takes a different path and is like, he runs 25 yards to the right of me, which is in timber, but I do have one big old hole that I can shoot at. And so I already got my bow around. I'm just trying to draw back and I'm about to feel like I'm about to fall out of my stand. And I finally get it back and I'm like, man, man. And I'm like yelling at it to stop it. It's like, I'm not even there. Yeah. And they're just so like hooked on this doe. They got their blinders on and I'm like, what is going on? But I was so, I felt like I was like in the middle of it, obviously. Like I kind of was like, I was in a small tree, low to the ground and like all of them, three out of four run directly below me. And like that doe's just huffing and puffing and all the other ones. Like I now understand when people say like they're, they're literally zombies during the rut. That's what it was. Like they were just every single one of them were screaming their heads off 24 seven as they ran by me. So I don't get a shot off, but I hear them cross the creek, go up, that next ridge and I hear him running around in there, but I can, it's a little bit quieter on the wind so I can hear him grunting still, but that, that slate rock moving and all that stuff. And I was like, that's what I heard yesterday. That's the exact sound I heard yesterday. So that's, I, th- I believe that's what I heard the evening before is them chasing probably that same doe around. That behavior seems like that was the first doe to go into estrus and they're like, no, 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 I'm getting this one. Dude. Well, I was telling you that was probably the best, most intense one of the most intense hunts of my life. Like, and I, I didn't even get a shot off. Like the, just that, just that little encounter, the atmosphere around that. I was like, I was so tense after all that was said and done. I was like, what just happened? And of course those two doe that were over there, not in heat, were just like slow stepping, like, please don't let them see me. Like, I don't want that. And I don't want them to do that to me, but your time's coming little lady. Don't, don't you worry. I'll give you the love and attention you deserve. Oh, yeah. You just bring them by me, sweetheart. I'll take care of it. That's what I'm saying. And the bow hunting, the rut stuff, it's like, it's a double-edged sword. It could bring something by that you've never had the chance to see before. But is that buck going to stop? I don't know. And mine, mine didn't. But the whole time I was like, Lord, just bring a buck by me, please. He brought four, but I guess I didn't specify that I wanted him to stop. So, yeah, he was like, ha ha. <laughs> I was hunting like probably half a mile away from you and mm-hmm. I ended up seeing uh, two does I had them while I was hunting on the edge of this kind of creek uh, right next to this clear cut and uh, I saw two does come out of that clear cut and of course they winded me because my wind was switching all the time um, they didn't blow but they did they, they just kind of bounded off and then I saw um and then I saw two uh, two deer working the this ridge, um, this big drainage going the other way. And I was like, you know, when you see them at like 150 yards through like thick stuff, you're like, oh, that could be a buck. That could be a buck. And I grabbed my binos and I was looking at them. First one, button buck. I'm like, dang it. Then another one came. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I pulled that up. Spike. It's like, dang it. Um, then I saw one more doe um, in that, in the, um, clear cut and then i had at 10 30 when i was starting to get down i had one more to walk to 10 yards and she was like i know something's here but i don't know where it is so she kind of just changed her route and then walked along the top of the of the drainage so i saw in that one sit i had saw um more activity than i seen the whole week so shout is yeah if you had a couple more days to hunt would you set in that same spot or would you feel more confident bouncing around again I would have volume hunted the crap out of that spot. Really? Yeah, just because you know there's deer. When you see deer on three sides of you, you're like, okay, I'm in the right area. Like, there's deer activity. I'm in a deer movement area. Especially there's different, like, different bucks. And different from, like, completely different directions. You're like, okay, I got a lot of good stuff going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I would have probably volume hunted that area and, you know, maybe got a shot at a buck. That's where that Carmel 8 point run away from me. So, if history is any determinants on the, on the, the future. But, no, nah, I mean, it was, it was a, the last couple of days were good hunting, but it's just like too little, too late. And I was looking at the forecast. I don't know if it's going to get a whole lot colder. Um, it can't get much worse than the week that we had, but yeah. no rain is coming and uh, looks like the heat wave is going to continue. So if you were me kind of given the same scenario, if I had a couple more days, knowing that there's more sign on the opposite side of this little creek, but the there isn't as much diversity, so to speak. But there's but there's more rubs. The majority of the rubs were on that side. Yeah. Would you would you try to set that 
or would you stay in the spot I was at? I would have said exactly where you were. I think so. Yeah, you had the bedding cover right there with that creek. Right, but there's, but there's a lot of bedding cover on the other side of that creek too. Like all, yeah, all that is yeah. just a creek and then the the grass. Well, I've seen that side you're talking about because we've hunted in that general area a decent mm-hmm. amount. I don't like that side nearly as much. But that's where the sign was and that's where they were they, they were chasing and running that doe. That's They chased them better. at you too though. Yeah, that is true. They chased them right underneath your tree. See, that's that. That's the way my mind works, though. It's like, oh, the grass is always greener. Like, I like I literally had four bucks within twenty five yards away from me, but that other side, I'm like, okay, there's like a lot more of a of a condensed travel corridor. Like it, like there's no going this way or maybe this way. It's just all straight this way. They could come from here, but if they're going to travel there, they're going to cross the creek or run along it. Which that's kind of what the sign was showing. I was thinking about this the other day and I'm like, maybe, maybe that's why, you know, would it be more beneficial to only hunt a spot that has one specific main travel route or is it better to have multiple? Because obviously like the whole time I feel like I, like we just preach the more diversity you can throw in an area, the better, which is true. But what about if it's, diversity in routes they have different routes and you can't really pinpoint or key in on exactly where they're going to walk which is already really tough down in the big wood stuff but like if you have one good trail and you know deer in that area is it better just to sit over that and wait for them to use that one specific trail or is it better to kind of try to sit amidst three or four of them but hope they kind of walk in your vicinity does that make sense the uh i think it matters like on that single trail like you know, hey, I might not see a lot, but if one comes by, I'm going to kill it kind of yeah, thing. You're definitely going to get a shot. I think I think that works better in a place with better deer density. Like when you're hunting in a place that doesn't have as many deer, it's like I feel like you have to give yourself as many options as you can if uh, or just be completely OK and willing to like not see anything until you see the one thing. But how many people are going to sit in one spot for four days in a row and not see a deer and still hunt there? Yeah, especially if your other people are from camp or seeing deer. Damn deer. Yeah, you're going to move. Yeah. That's for sure. But that's just the mind game. That's what. I hate about it is to like, that's what it's tough. Like just, it's tough. It's tough to keep yourself in the game. You you know, you're in a good spot, but it's like, Hey, I know this is a good spot, but like we always talk about, it, it might just not be good right now. You know, here in the next couple of days, it could be dynamite, but are you going to stick that out? Are you going to try to find the hot sign now? And it's like, typically you're only down there for a certain amount of time. You're going to try to find the hot sign now. So that's just what eats at me constantly when I'm right. Around. It's that only takes one mentality though. You know, like, I like to be in an area where I'm seeing deer because I feel like seeing deer. There, there is difference between seeing deer and killing deer. There's a lot of areas you can go see a lot of deer. You're not gonna kill mm-hmm. one, but you can see a lot. And so, try to make those, those find a spot where those two things work together. And it, I think you're in a great spot. You had four bucks run underneath you, and the, the only reason you didn't get a shot because they were zombified to a point where they wouldn't stop. And it's like, what else can you ask for besides them to stop? You know, I'm with you. Um, so Jordan and Justin are. You guys are going to see a lot more of their footage on the channel. Uh, recently, we got we got them both uh, cameras, GoPros, where they're filming uh, their hunts, and Justin got his doe kill on film. But they're going to be filming for us. You guys have seen them on videos uh, quite a bit, so they're the, kind of the newest uh, blood, I guess, to the crew. Jordan was hunting, I think, just a big drainage and had a buck on, a, buck on a doe come by. The previous, I think it was Wednesday, or no, sorry. Uh, Tuesday, 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 four. Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. night, um, had a buck at 60, couldn't get the deer. Uh, shot went back to the exact same area and then had another buck come in at he moved just slightly had one at 35 yards and i think eventually what he said is he shot and hit a limb good pope and young class buck he didn't find which i was hoping that justin and jordan i didn't know they were leaving wednesday night to uh head back to Venita. i was hoping they were going to get to talk about it on the podcast because i had all the stuff and we were going to do a podcast on wednesday night but they ended up heading out and didn't come back till we were left shoot maybe we'll see him again sometime and we can have Jordan recap that fully, but yeah, Jordan was seeing bucks. I think he got a shot at one and didn't connect, but, um, that's part of it, man. Want to talk about shooting at one and not connecting. I know what that feels like. Uh, shot at one on Monday or on, uh, Saturday and didn't get it. So the damn limbs. Yeah. Yeah. The limbs are two, two and O oh against us on this vacation, but no, it was, a, it was a fun trip and it's feast or fam another rut, dude. I just, I know I've complained about the weather a hundred times, but I just, that's the one thing that I felt like just never really, it hasn't clicked for us the last couple of years. 
Like no, to their just, it, too little, too late is the best way to sum it up. Yeah, but even even a few years ago when I went with Justin, when the weather was good, it was like bucks sprinting all over the place, could never get one stopped. Yeah, I'm just like, dang, I want that good pre rut time period with the right weather, you know, and like you got these puzzle pieces and they're just never coming together exactly how you want them to so so real quick when are you uh when do you think you're going to be able to get back out there or are you going to get back out there and where's that going to be at i'm gonna hide by my house a little bit here in georgetown try to shoot a, i gotta shoot a couple of those before i can uh hunt a buck where i'm hunting on this public so i'm gonna try to get that done and then back to kansas in in december for the rifle season but i'm gonna be using a muzzle loader so that's the hope I, I'm going to try to get a little bit of a break. I know it's the heat of the rut, but we've been going hard. I got, I don't know if my, if Justin brought, my grandpa has COVID right now and I don't know if Justin brought it down to the camper or what, but it's hitting me. Nice. Good right now. Thank you. Love it. So I'm going to try to get over that and then get right back out there in, in Texas. I'd love to say I'm escaping the heat in Texas, but I'm not. <laughs> it, it, if, dude, it follows me wherever I go. Hopefully we can get some weather down here. What about you? Man, I'm going to try to get, get back down there on that public. Cause I think Justin and Jordan's going to be down there all week this week as well. You're going to go back. And so, yeah, I'm going to try to, well, Peyton's hunting the lease this week. So I was either going to hunt the lease or go down there back to public. And since he's hunting lease, I, that leaves me with one option. So I'm going to get caught up on work the next couple of days and then hopefully get my butt back down there for the weekend and hopefully get one of those zombified bucks to stop. Can't kill him on the couch. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, good. It is the most wonderful time of the year and big bucks are falling. I've been seeing it all over social media. That's the thing. And that's what I think people need to understand. Like, yeah, kind of like in your position, there might be a little bit of burnout happening because we've been going since like the 1st of September. But August. August, yeah, August. August. But this is the time to be out there. If you're going to just mindlessly sit in a tree and not really like just play on your phone, but just be out there in the tree because anything could happen at this point, right? Like we're at that little pendulum swing where it's like, we used to say that, Hey, it's only going to get better from here. It's only going to get better from here. But here in the next couple of weeks, that's it's, when it is going to get, yeah, you're going to reach the peak and then it's just going to go downhill from there. And so you really need to take that in consideration on whether you use PTO or choose wisely because, you know, it's only going to get worse here in the next couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden you got holidays. So you got to have fam- like family time's great, but dang it, it's more tough to get out in the woods. So you, we just got to keep that in mind and, uh, and stay hunting. There's a time to go hard and there's a time to take it easy. This is not the time to, uh, start packing your crap up for the winter. Yeah, and exactly. I I'm feeling that way, but I'm not going to let myself fall into that. Yeah. I, I won't let you son. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, I I wish I could have got these two does shot previously so I could be hunting a buck right now. But the thing is, like, I hunted for does, and I'm not kidding you. It was 97, 100 degrees. A lot of the evenings I was hunting, I'm like, dude, I can't can't do this. I can't hike two miles back in here when it's 100 degrees. So, without having to wash my clothes every hunt, and I don't like doing that, So Yeah, no, it gets bad. Uh, They start stinky, stinky, stinky. Uh, But, yeah, guys, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Uh, like Christian said in the beginning, we got a lot of different formats. We got the basics of hunting. We got people that come on, uh, where we have guests of, you know, some big buck killers that know way more than us. And, you know, that ain't a very hard skill to surpass, but yeah. you know, then we also have these hunt talks, which are tend to be our favorite. It's more water cooler type stuff, but, uh, yeah, be sure to like subscribe, go follow us on our other socials and, uh, always know that Jesus loves you and leave us a rating interview. Thank you. Bye. Bye.